Here we go. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature is made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Now, we finished last time on the idea that God loves us uh, and we are his children. We've not received the spirit of uh, bondage again to fear. Uh, but in verse 17, if we're children, then we're heirs of God and co-heirs with the Messiah. It, and then it brings out this idea, if we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. And we were talking about the importance of suffering. Now, one of the seven great stages that all saved people must go through, uh, one, one of those stages is reconciliation to God. And that's the purpose of suffering. That's the purpose of suffering. And we noticed in 1 Peter 4, he that suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And you remember in, in Hebrews, twice it says that Christ learned obedience. Now, the, now in being reconciled to God, uh, the thing is that God never changes. God is never accommodated to us. We always have to be accommodated to God, which is another word for obedience. And so the process of reconciliation is a process of obedience of coming into conformity, of coming into conformity with God, with his person, and with his will. And the thing that accomplished this for Jesus was suffering. And it's the thing that accomplishes it for us. We can make all the religious uh, desires and vows that we want to, but the thing that reconciles us to God is suffering. Uh, and it doesn't have to be physical suffering like the little girl, but, it, but there are many forms of suffering, many forms of suffering, many forms of giving us trouble, problems, pain, confusion, uh, just a, an unsettledness in which we do not have rest. And that is suffering or tribulation. And it is a major part of making man in, in, uh, in the stages of redemption is reconciliation. Now, the history of the church for 2,000 years has been one of suffering. Now, in, in this, this is the first century in which men have been so evil in the churches that they have tried to reject the idea that Christians are to suffer. I don't know if this ever has appeared before in church history, but for the first time, man has gotten himself near enough to Antichrist to challenge this principle and to say, if we have faith, we needn't suffer. And of course, this was carried to great extremes uh, at the height of the prosperity movement. I don't, I think now it's taken on a more sophisticated form in the reconstruction movement, which I think is a more sophisticated form of the prosperity message and the faith message. The idea if you, uh, that uh, if we will serve the Lord and have faith, it is God's will that we be the head and not the tail in this world. In other words, that we not suffer. See, the bottom line is that we don't suffer. The Christians will have all the money. The Christians will be healthy. The Christians will be in political power. The Christians will have their way. And I don't think this has ever uh, appeared before. Christians, I think, have been more or less, uh, maybe through the uh, influence of the Catholic Church, which I think has always 
kind of had the idea that uh, of the suffering Christ and that people suffer. Uh, suffering is a normal part. Is that right, uh, Barbara? This, uh, the, I never heard the Catholic Church preaching, you know, that Christians were supposed to be gleeful people. They're supposed to be happy people, but suffering is a part of the Christian life, certainly. And so throughout the centuries, I don't think the priests or the preachers ever told people that they would not suffer. But we have become so man-centered. Uh, and the idea of zero risk, you probably heard that expression. Uh, they say, well, how far do you want to go with banning uh, cancer-producing things? And how far do you want to go in, uh, with safety devices and everything? The idea is zero risk. Well, that's, first place, it's impractical. This world will never be a zero risk for anybody. In the second place, it is it shows man's man has gotten to the place now where he's looking at himself and saying, "Why should I hurt? Why should I not have everything I want?" And of course, abortion is a reflection of that. Uh, no one would ever dream of suggesting abstinence as a method of solving the problem of, of unwanted children, because that implies suffering. Anything that anything in our culture that is directed toward making people even uncomfortable is an abomination. Before uh, before anesthetics were invented, people suffered horribly at the hands of surgeons. They died at the hands of surgeons just from the pain and the shock of uh, eye surgery, skull surgery, uh, uh, giving you. Uh, a cloth to bite and a dose of whiskey while they sawed off your leg, uh, which they did uh, on many occasions during the wars, amputations without anesthetic. We, we can't even believe in such a thing. But that's the way people, that's the way mankind has been in its history. Uh, people died at an early age of things that are, you know, just cured readily now of infection, uh, bef even just lately before penicillin uh, uh, came into being, it was common for people to die of bacterial infections. And, and when the sulfur drugs and penicillin came into uh, being, then these things which influenza, many, many multitudes of people have died of the flu, you know, in history and, uh, and the Black Plague and other things. So the history of mankind has been one of suffering. And on top of this, the church has had persecution. And people have said, well, why, if God is good, and he can prevent all this, why is there so much suffering in the world? And the answer is, see, there are seven great stages that man must go through, and one of them is the stage of reconciliation. And reconciliation, we're born, we're, uh, it's no accident that in the sixth day of creation that it started off with animals and then went to man. That's no accident, that's symbolic. And it means that when we start off, we are animals, and we have to be made in the image of God. The unsaved man is an, is an intelligent animal, and doctors recognize that as such, and act as though that is the case. He is an intelligent animal, and uh, so many doctors are believers in evolution. He just evolved up from an ape, and this is what he is, and they know things that have happened uh, that we don't, that point toward the fact that man at one time was an animal, which is not so, but there is these kinds of things that happen. And so it's not uncommon for scientists to regard man as an animal. It's the rest of us that can't see that. But your unsaved man, your unsaved man who does not have Jesus is a smart animal. He's an intelligent animal. He has the potential to become a son of God. So it's no accident that on the sixth day, on the same day of creation, you have the land animals and man created in that one day, because that's exactly what happens to us. We start off as animals, eating, sleeping, reproducing, playing, working, and then we make the transition in our lifetime over to a son of God, and we make that largely by suffering. We don't realize it, but it's the suffering that keeps us tuned up. And that tuning up, the purpose of that tuning up, the thrust of that tuning up, is an ever confirmation or a pressing or a reconciling to the person and ways and will of God. That is very important. It's, it's, uh, it's something that we're treating today 
I, I think probably some of us even in this church figure, well, this is a nuisance. But you see, men didn't used to think that way. It's part of life. It's been the history of the Christian church. The, the Christian church, we would have never had any saints in the church if there had been no suffering. It is necessary. There is no avoiding of it. It's a part of life, like breathing. We must allow the Lord to exercise his will on us in any way that he chooses because there is no other way toward reconciliation to God. Even Jesus had to suffer. We all have to suffer because when we do not, we are alienated from God. We are foolish. We are like a beast before God. We have... We are like beasts with one another. And when God begins to bring us into that process of breaking us and snaring us, we begin to learn manners in the courts of heaven. The, the, the foolish bestiality, the lust, the covetousness, the wild abandon, the partying, the drunkenness, uh, and witchcraft, and all these things that are an abomination of God, when we burn enough, we either become rebellious and, and, and an enemy of God or else we bow the knee and say, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And we in this church, many of us are going through it now. It's one thing after another. And it's going to get worse. But at the same time, it's going to open up for you gardens that are not open at this time. It's going to open up for you Fellowship with God that is not open at this time. There, it is the price tag. It is the doorway to glory. And there is none other. So it is desirable because I don't think anyone in this room, their prime objective is ease of mind. Our prime objective is God. And this is the path to God. And ultimately, perfect ease of mind perfect peace and perfect joy and perfect love. But this is the path. It's straight, it's narrow, and it leads to life. And few find it. While mankind uh, uh, drowns itself in a drunken orgy in the pursuit, they're pursuing joy and we're pursuing joy. We're going to get joy. They will never get joy. You can never get joy by being yourself and keeping yourself separate from God. You cannot do it. We try. Many, many, will, even Christians, will never surrender that thing. They will never surrender. Never. Never. They will maintain their own way before God. And in so doing, they deprive themselves of the very thing they want. So, the, 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 the greatest word in, in language is not my will, but thine be done. That's the greatest word in language. There is no greater word than that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. Now, the first one to suffer is the head of the body. And after that comes those who are closest to him. And after that will come the church. And I, and I think that uh, the things that the Lord has made clear in the Gospels about his servants, not the world, his servants, the only time to my knowledge that the term outer darkness is used is for the Lord's servants. And when the term stripes are used, it is for his servants. And many of the Lord's servants are going to be saved by fire. They're going to be chastened. They're going to receive many stripes. And they're going to be cast into outer darkness. And I think it doesn't say they're cast into the lake of fire. It says they're cast into outer darkness. It says they're beaten with stripes. It is not the lake of fire. And I firmly believe that they will be saved. And well, this, I know that this is true because the scripture says so. They will not have reward. Their works will be burned up. But they will be saved in the sense that they will eventually end up on God's new earth. They will be saved, but as by fire. Now, what is the purpose of that fire? The purpose of that fire is to reconcile them to God. That's why you whip a horse. Now, our, our, 
I, I had a notice in the paper that the, the uh, Department of Agriculture is, has reproved the wild animal park because they chasing an elephant. That is characteristic of our society. You don't chase in anything. If they get, uh, there's a group now trying to get a law passed that you cannot touch a child. You can't even slap his wrist. You cannot touch him physically in reproof of any kind. This is, comes right from the pit of hell and is designed to create monsters. But this tendency, not even an animal must suffer, nothing must suffer, is contrary to the ways of God and to the word of God. And so what we, when we have that kind of love, that's not love at all. That is um, um, a fleshly delusion that people must not suffer. It's the best thing in the world for us. And uh, I'm sure that's the purpose of the Great Tribulation is, is the bride must have this mellowing process or she will not be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Picture the bride today. If she's going to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, she's not going to get that way by coming to church and listening to somebody play the piano for entertainment or listening to a great choir or listening to or being amused and entertained in some other way. She isn't going to get rid of her spots that way. She isn't even going to cry out to God until she is in desperation. Is it that way with you? And you see, and then, as soon as the saints are let loose upon the nations, what do they do? They smash them with a rod of iron. People think the millennium is going to be a time of peace. They're crazy in the head. The millennium is going to be a time of reconciling nations to God, and it's going to be done not with uh, education. It's going to be done with the rod of iron administered by the saints. The whole creation must suffer, 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 beginning with Christ. Praise the Lord. And the purpose of it is not to make us unhappy. It is so we will respond to God in a way that produces in us obedience and righteousness. And there is no other way, so we accept it, just like a bitter medicine that you take and you hate it and you hold your nose and you swallow it and complain, but you do it because it gets the job done. You don't want to drink soda if it isn't going to do the job because it tastes better. You drink the stuff the man gave you because that is going to heal you. And it's that way with the Lord. So that's why we find the expression about children and sons immediately followed with suffering is because suffering produces reconciliation. Cry unto uh, uh, Jerusalem that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. The two have to go together. He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I beseech ye, be ye reconciled to God. So that's the way it has been throughout church history. So the sufferings of men are not a sign that God is not good or that God does not love us, but a sign that he does love us and he's interested in changing us from an animal to a man on the sixth day. See, the sixth day of creation, the number six is the day in which man is made in God's image. The number six is the day of the Levitical feast of the Day of Atonement, the Day of Reconciliation. The number six is the day. One can wonder, well, why does God wait till the end of the process, the last thing before rest, to reconcile us to himself? It's because the process of reconciliation cannot obtain until we pass through the other stages first of um, life and uh, getting dry ground under us and the unveiling process and the other things that must happen to us before we're ready to be reconciled to God. It's, it's nothing to be done with a young Christian who's just been saved. 
It must be people who have their feet under them and who have the revelation of God and who can cooperate with us in the intelligent way. And then they can respond to the Lord. All right. In um, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are uh, not worthy to be compared with the glory that is be, to be revealed to us. And in the preceding verse, I question that preposition because uh, too, because in the preceding verse it says glorified with him. So I think the glory is going to come with us and through us and not primarily to us. However, time will tell. That will also be true, I guess. So notice the time-binding factor here that we consciously and deliberately say to ourselves, yes, I'm suffering now, but it's such a short time, and I've got an advantage over you guys because I'm older. I think, oh boy, pretty soon, no more income tax. No more problems like that. They'll be over. They're for this world. Praise the Lord. So I've got an advantage over you guys. I can time bind better. Because I, you know, I'd hate to be 20. Man, what you got to look forward to. But you, you have, you can say to yourself, even at the age of 20, that uh, this still is nothing compared with the glory which is ahead. This is our chance to be demonstrated. See, not everybody gets this opportunity by any means. We are in an unveiling of the purposes of God. You see, God keeps things in darkness, and then he unveils. He, he divides the light from the darkness, and he unveils. And, um, and, and every man, every man who's going to be saved must be un unveiled at some point. But you see, God unveils. Uh, you look at a child. You can't tell a thing about that child. You don't know. You know all kids are cute. And some of them grow up to be saints, and some grow up to be monsters. And you can't tell by looking at them. But God knows. God knows. And, and life is a process of unveiling. We look at it in a different way. But see, God sees it as an unveiling. And we don't know, of, we don't even know ourselves. A man finds himself in death row. And he wonders, how in the world did I get here? This is an unveiling that takes place of your destiny. And uh, so not everybody has the opportunity that we have to know God, to cooperate with him, and to be brought forward to glory. Not if that's our destiny, and it's being unveiled in our life because in the vicissitudes of the Christian life, we have stayed with it while others have uh, fallen away by the wayside. Why? Because we are better than they? No, no, no. And if we have any experience with God, we realize what frail dust creatures we are. And the very fact that we stay with it shows that there's an unveiling of something that God planted in the beginning. In fact, from the foundation of the world. And it's being unveiled. So, in a short while, just a short while, we'll be glorified together with Jesus. So if we realize that the sufferings of this present time, are they're not to be compared with and that's talking about the resurrection, not about dying and getting rid of income tax and getting rid of other problems. It, that, this is talking about the time of the resurrection when we shine, when we receive a body like the body of the Lord Jesus. And what we're going through now, we put our hands in the hand of God and don't quit. Don't quit. Things will happen to you you do not understand. Don't quit. Don't quit. Keep on going. Let God unveil what's there. Just keep on going and you'll make it. God will never fail. He will never break his covenant with you. He will never break his covenant. If the covenant is broken, it's because you broke it. God will not break his covenant with you. So what, see, our tendency is to count suffering a strange thing. See, and marvel not at the fiery trials which try us a strange thing. Now why is that? Why do we call them a strange thing? It's because the kind of sufferings that come to us are not the kind that we expect. See, we think, oh, I'm going to suffer because I'm going to get cancer. There's worse sufferings in this world than cancer. Or, I, or I'm going to suffer because I'm going to be run over. 
Not necessarily. If that was so, you wouldn't count it a strange thing. You'd say, yes, I, I was told I would suffer, and now I'm in the hospital and I'm suffering. But the reason we count it a strange thing is because it hits us in a way we don't anticipate, or it hits someone we love, which causes us more suffering than it does a loved one <laughs> in some instances. So it catches us off guard, and we say, this is strange. I, these strange ashes, I don't understand why God would work like this with me. They get not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is a trial, as though some strange thing happened. But it's to reconcile, it's to bring out and to test, to see if we are going to serve God or not. See, that's the purpose of it, to see whether he will keep his commandments or not, to see if we are reconciled to his person and his way. To see if God can probe and puncture something in there. Why doesn't God know it? I guess he does. But the Bible teaches that he finds out by bringing us into a difficult situation. Abraham with Isaac went through a very strange, strange, fiery trial. But it says God did test Abraham. And when that was over, he said, now I know that you fear God. See, now I know that you're reconciled to my person and my way and my will. That there's not something in Abraham that's still an individualistic, that's saying, I will approach God in my own way. Submission, commitment, reconciliation. This is what suffering accomplishes. To the end, we may be glorified together so that we may break the nations. See, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience once your obedience has been fulfilled. You look at the things in the paper, and I'm telling you, it's, 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 I was telling the Lord today, I don't even want to see this stuff anymore uh, that goes on. It's so unjust, it's so perverse and wrong. Thank God. I was saying to Audrey, maybe we'll die pretty quick. I don't even want to live in a world where people are doing this kind of thing. I don't want to be here while they abort children, the games that are played in government. They have always have been. And uh, the people of integrity suffer and the deceitful win that's been that way through history. And there's no use gnashing your teeth over it. God says, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. So nobody is getting away with anything. If we're just patient. And, and when people go out to, to remediate these things by force. Say, I've had it, I'm going to go out, I'm going to do something about the drunk drivers. If I have to get out and smash their car with a sledgehammer, I'm going to do something about drunk drivers. You know, that, that's uh, naturally when someone's child gets run away, that's the way you feel. Or I'm going to do something about these adults that come on the high school campus and, and, uh, and push drugs and get the kids interested in drugs. I'm going to do something about these adults that are coming on the high school campuses uh, to invite uh, the youngsters to witches' covens, which they do, you know. And all these, I'm going to do something about it. But you see, that, God says, no, that's not righteous. That's not righteous. You have problems with disobeying me. Don't look around at everybody else and what they're doing to disobey. You have problems. You do what I say and become completely obedient to me and completely reconciled to me. And when that is done, when that is finished in your life, then I will revenge all disobedience. Make sense to you? That's the way it's going. We're not allowed now to do the things that we would like to do. We're not allowed to avenge ourselves. We're not allowed to correct injustices. The Christian church never has been able to, to do that unless it has become a political instrument and has lost its calling. But as long as it stayed before Christ in humility, worshiping him, it has been a suffering church. Burden bearers, people who give themselves to prayer and intercession for others, who, who are smitten and shut their mouth, who suffer injustice. This has been the 2,000 years you can read about. It. But in the end, they will appear with Jesus in glory 
and the shoe will be on the other foot. You say, but those people will all be dead that harm them. No, they won't. The two realms will converge at that time and there'll be no place to hide. And the saints will face those who persecuted them, having the upper hand, having in a readiness to revenge, avenge all disobedience once your obedience has been fulfilled. So we have to take it now and shut our mouth in justice, be persecuted, and all this, like Paul said, we're made the offscouring of the world. But what we're looking for is not justice in this world. If you do, you will only get yourself in the flesh and, and hurt yourself and a lot of people around you. God will not allow you to justify yourself. Even if your reputation is ruined, God will not allow you to justify yourself. You have to wait God's time and let him do it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's the story of Christianity. It's a despised, rejected group of people. But in the end, they will be exalted and made the rulers of mankind. And those who harm them will appear before them. And they, and they will deal in God's justice. Not in sympathy, but in God's true, true justice. The saints are going to judge the world. But if you're not willing now to accept injustice, suffering, you will not be a part of it. It's, it's the way God has put the things together. Christ suffered more than any man, so he is the supreme judge. After him comes the saints who have suffered, been made the offscouring of all things, thrown into burning ovens, whipped, burned at the stake, drowned, cast into vats of boiling oil, broken on the rack, hung, decapitated. At the end, they will stand before their tormentors in glory. That's God's way. So it says, so Paul, who suffered a great deal in his life, his life was not an enviable one by our standards, I consider that these that I'm suffering, Paul says, are not worthy to be compared. I'm not even going to talk about I'm not even going to bring reproach on my maker by blatting all the time about how I'm suffering. Hey, guys, there's a temptation when stuff piles up on your head to begin to feel sorry for yourself and to begin to complain. And then you're going to, you know, even if you don't get out of your mouth, it's going up before God. Oh, man, now this and this. And when I feel I like gloom and doom and all this and all this, you have to take heed to your spirit. You have to gird up the loins of your mind and say, I will not bring reproach on my God in this way. You say, Father, I praise you for what you've done for me. I praise you for what you're doing for me. I praise you for what you're going to do. You're a faithful, trustworthy God, and you don't, you have to do that just you. Just gird up your mind and your spirit and take heed to it and not charge your maker with uh, in, injustice like that. That means we don't get to feel sorry for ourselves. That means we don't get to complain. And that means we don't get to blame other people. Huh? We can do it if we put our mind to it and it brings glory to the Lord. And you can say to the angels, see, look at the stuff piled on their back. I guard it. And uh, they're still praising me. It doesn't make any difference. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, this is another unveiling. Unveilings, Christ was unveiled. The creation was unveiled. The sons of God. The reason for the unveiling is that God, see, God created all things, but it's all in darkness. He doesn't even let the angels. He doesn't even tell Jesus. He doesn't tell anybody what he's doing. He keeps it all in darkness. That's why the Lord said, no man knows the day or the hour. The Father only knows. He's the only one who knows. And the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, God creates all things, but then they're in darkness. And then he, he does a very, then, then he, he creates light. He creates light. 
And then he does a funny thing. He divides the light from the darkness, which is not possible in the physical realm. You can't do that in the physical realm. But what that's saying is that God hides everything. He hides what he's doing. And at just the right time, he unveils it so that people can see it. Now, there's light in the sons of God today. There's light in them, but the creation cannot see it. But there will come an unveiling. And then they'll say, oh, that's what was in God's mind. See, that happened to the angels on the day of creation as God began to move and things began to appear on the earth. Oh, that's what's in his mind. Dry ground. Oh, veg vegetation. And these things in the ferment. Oh, that's what he had in mind. But what does it mean? And then fish out of the water. What are these things? What does it mean? It's all hidden in God. There's an unveiling here. Oh, this is so strange, but where is it all leading? And then on, this, then on the sixth day uh, came forth the great land animals, the cats and the other animals. And, oh, that's marvelous. Look at them all down there. And what does this all mean? What, what, what's the meaning of it all? I don't understand the meaning of it all. This is going on in the angel's mind. Certainly they didn't know. They couldn't read God's mind. They'd never seen anything like this before. This was new. Do you realize what it says in the Bible, in the beginning? In the beginning? That's the way Genesis starts off. Uh, in is ba. Ba rashit. Ba rashit. Uh, and the same way the Gospel of John starts off the same way. And he are he. In the beginning. Beginnings are important. That meant there was, uh, before that, w there was only spiritual things. Material things did not exist. And in the beginning, it means not in the beginning of God or in the beginning of Christ, but in the beginning of the material world. It was hidden in the mind of God what he had in mind to do. And God knew, at that time, God knew your name. And that one day, which hasn't even come to pass yet, you would be unveiled as a unique revelation of God. Think about that for majesty. But the angels couldn't see anything because darkness was on the face of it. And that darkness was a darkness without sun, without moon, without stars, without electric lights, without fire, without any kind of light. Stygian, black, total darkness. On the face of the deep, there's nothing you can see. And then God said, let there be light with no sun, no stars, no moon, no electric lights, no fire. Just think of that. God said, let there be light. And light came out from God. And they could see. L look at this. Look at this. Begin to see. And the darkness was separated. The light was separate, divided from the darkness. And they could begin to witness the material, something had been made that was never had been in the spirit realm. Think of it. Think of it. And it got up to the time of the animals and they were marveling. Well, what does it mean? They're not angels. They can't soar around in the spirit realm. They lumber around on the earth and chew on the vegetation. What is God saying? Huh? That a marvelous? And then God reached down into the red clay, into the red clay of the ground, and he fashioned a man in his image, male and female, to have fruit, uh, fruitfulness and dominion. And you can just see the angels looking at that thing. Something, and what is it made of? And what is in it? It has a soul like God and a form like God. And God made it out of the dust. What does this? And it's been that way through history. Men do not know the meaning of anything. That's why they came up with the philosophy of philosophies of nihilism and 
existentialism, which means there's no purpose to anything. That in life, what you're supposed to do is paddle your canoe, paddle your raft, and keep it off the rocks, but the currents are carrying it, and you don't know where it's going. Tolstoy talked a lot about this, about uh, the power there is behind history and about how men are only just float around. And philosophers all through the years have speculated, what? There's no meaning to all this. And why does God, uh, where does the church, this crazy church thing, where does it fit in? And why does God let people just suffer? And you can see man's answer to this question of why. And where is it going? Today is the way society responds today. What's the response of society today? Eat, drink, and be merry. Because pretty soon you're going to go to a convalescent home and we're going to keep you alive for 30 years on expensive equipment. And after you have lived 20 years after you died, you're going to die. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you're going to be in a rest home. That's our answer. And the church, is, is, as far as America is concerned, and most of the educated nations, the church is, is a nuisance. And I think it was, um, who, uh, who was this, uh, Voltaire that called the Jews a pimple on the face of humanity. They, they could see no reason. What does it mean, these argumentative people that came and talk about M Moses and the law and all this? He says, they're a pimple on the face of humanity. And Voltaire died a hideous death. He wasn't rewarded for that comment. Rejected it. But these are the brilliant men that have found no answer. And so God is going to unveil his sons, just like he did Adam. And people will look at them and the light that's in them, and, and they'll realize that God loves them as he loves Jesus, and the glory that he gave to Jesus is in them, and they're like, they're like the brothers of Jesus, and all things will be given to them. All things will be given to them. All things, all things, people, the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the animals, everything, 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 everything will be given into the hands of the sons of God. It won't be like today that we wander around as a despised people. They will have everything. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. And things means of the material creation. The material creation comprises things. The wind will be in the power of the sons of God. The mountains. See, that was a sign to man. He put all things under his feet. But we've never dreamed of what the fullness of that word it means that the very configuration of the ground, nothing, nothing, nothing will be there where man is subject to it. Everything will be subject to man. Everything. Now we're made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. But in that day, we will be in charge of all of the works of God's hands. That's what he wants for his sons. I will be his God, Revelation 21, 7. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. God has this desire to create this world, and he created it to be governed by man. And we start off, as an animal, and then, because we're an animal, we have to be born again. And the second time we're born, we're not born of an animal. The second time we're born, we're born of God, because we are God's sons and heirs. 
and heirs of all things. It's hard to conceive in this life where we're subject to sickness, we're subject to gravity, we're subject to uh, the government, we're subject to all kinds of physical constraints, tiredness, a body that uh, becomes tired and ill and nervous and frantic, and we don't have the answers to things. We're just under tutors and governors constantly. People say we have free will. They're crazy. They haven't thought. We, none of us at any given time have but uh, just a handful of choices. Sometimes we don't even have that, it seems. We're just boxed in completely. Oh, we have anything but free will. There's un, any number of things you could want to do tonight that, that the circumstances will not permit you to do that. You couldn't swim across the Pacific Ocean. You're limited by your strength. There are animals that can, but you can't. You're limited in all kinds of ways. You can't jump as high as this church. You can't do it. You don't have a free will. You're in a little box, and you just have a little way that you can move around in. And that's because you're destined to rule all things but not until you're reconciled to God. We, you know, we wish we had power to heal the sick and power to do this and power to do that. That's, that's uh, small potatoes compared to what's coming. It's small potatoes even, concern, even compared to the latter rain revival that's coming. It's good to cover uh, spiritual gifts. It's good, a good thing to do that. But keep in mind the larger that is coming is the whole nations are going to be brought in. And you will rule them and tell them what to do and they have no alternative. The glory which shall be revealed in us. And notice it says that the, uh, the, cre uh, the creation for the anxious longing of the creation, that's the material realm, waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now I don't think they know what they're waiting for. But that's what they're waiting for. And if we could hear the cry that goes up from the earth tonight, the mother that's just lost her child, the husband that's just lost his wife, the wife that's just lost her husband, if we could hear the cry of people going up from the earth, it's one long wail. The dog that's just been run over by a car. The person lying in the hospital with a brain cancer. Boy, there's one place you can go to be sure that it's doing a land office business, and that's a hospital. I mean, you can't get in the parking lot. Suffering mankind. They're wailing. What does it mean? Where is it going? Will it ever end? That's why drugs is the problem that it is. That's why the teenagers are committing suicide. What makes less sense than a person 17 years old committing suicide? They're doing it by the hundreds here in this country. Teenage suicide, even going down uh, to almost the preteens. Why? Because the creation is one great groan. And this is an affluent nation. Just looking at life and saying, I don't want any part of this. I'll hang myself. Maybe there's something better on the other side. There's only one Solution. And what is that? The sons of God. The creation is waiting for the unveiling of the sons of God. Because the sons of God will show what God is about just as the animals made the transition to Adam. We will make the transition from man to being sons of God. Doesn't say the creation is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of men, but the sons of God. And heretofore in the Bible, that expression has referred to angels. Now it refers to, to those who at one time were men, who at one time were flesh and blood, who at one time were bound in mortal bodies. Now they're the sons of God with all power and all authority. And the creation will look at them. Can you imagine the things that will go through people's minds when they see these glowing, light-filled people probably of giant size or any size they choose to be because even that won't be a limitation. 
They want to appear two inches high, they'll appear two inches high. They want to appear a mile high, they'll appear a mile high. You're going to have to stretch your brain. Do you realize that the new Jerusalem on the earth, on the new earth, is 2,500 miles on a side? There's no building on earth that approaches one mile in height. The new Jerusalem is a cube. It's laid out this way, 2,500 uh, uh, 2, miles. That's about two-thirds of the way across the United States. The city, it's laid out this way, 2,500 uh, uh, 2, uh, 2, miles, and it's 2,500 2, miles up into the air, which means that it wouldn't fit on this earth. See, because it would interfere with the rotation of the earth. Well, I mean, it's up there 2,500 miles. The air ceases, what, two miles up? So it's far up above. So the size of the things that are coming, the size of them, and the glory of them. I mean, the peoples of the earth, you know, they're, they're, they're fa they'll be facing creatures that they can't even conceive. These are all sons of God. These are the sons of God. This is what life means. This is what people are supposed to be. This is what God has in mind. He's unveiled his sons. And to think they used to be creatures like us. That's where we're going. That's why I'm telling you, the goal is resurrection. It's not to go up and read the funnies in a mansion. It's to attain this glory. Hallelujah. All right. For the creation was subjected to futility. Can you think of a better word to describe the world? Do you know what futility means? Helpless, hopeless, goalless, aimless, frustrating. Everything you try to do goes to pot. You build something and it falls over. You plant something and it's full of bugs. You try to do something and it goes crazy. Futility. Is there, and people never get the message. They still keep on. Some, now I've got a plan. Now this has got a The Democrats have got a plan. Now the Republicans have got a plan. Or the Nazis have got a plan. Or the Communists have got a plan. Somebody's got a plan, and it keeps falling and failing and failing, and, and mankind is just like they're blind, and they just keep going in circles, and one will say to the other, now I see, and he doesn't see anything at all, and they just keep going like that, futility. And it's, and it's put in man's heart, and he can't stop and say to himself, now this is stupid, where is this thing going, what does it mean, why am I working like this, why am I the slave of my body, why am I destroying myself with cigarettes and booze, what, you know, what, Reading today in the paper, here's a, some poor woman running around naked in the street, uh, pounding on cars with a chain. You know, people are going crazy. And, and one thing that, that is sending people crazy is, is this drug crystal. And they don't, they don't stop and say to themselves, now I had a friend that took crystal and he, and he ended up doing some crazy thing or, or running into a, a wall uh, five times uh, to try to knock himself out or something. They don't say that. They, they keep on taking it. And they don't say to themselves, I made $200 you know, in a couple of days, so I'll buy cocaine, snort it all up my nose, and there goes all my money. And what happened? I felt good, and now I feel worse than I did when I started. Futility. They can't stop and say, this is making no sense. We're the only people, we Christians, that have anything that is going anywhere. Where they aren't. The people get rich, and all it does is make them miserable. You ever been around rich people? They're the most miserable people there are. You don't want to be a bottom. They are stingier than all other people. They're nervous about all their stuff. They're afraid if you go in their house, you don't ever want to let your kids go in their house because it sure as a world they'll knock over an $800 vase or something. And that ruined their day. So they're not happy. We're the only people that have anything. It's gone anyway. And the creation is going no place. It is waiting. That's what I say. 
Don't bother yourself with the 11 o'clock news. Pray and you'll make news. They have nothing. You've got it all. Pray and you'll make news. You make something happen. The creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now, who is him? God, and what is the hope? That one day, he'll be able to bring mankind into glory. All right? Because the creation itself, the physical realm, your body, the mountains, the trees, the oceans. In the beginning, the material realm and the spiritual realm were one. And that's why there were trees like the tree of life growing out of the ground. Has anybody got a tree of life growing in your backyard? They will not grow out of material soil. Is that right? The tree of life will not grow out of material soil. But it did in the beginning. And the tree of knowledge grew out of... What does that tell us? That tells us that at one time, the spirit realm, the, the physical realm, was a clothing for the spirit realm. The physical realm was a house in which the spirit realm dwelt. And then what God did, he created a thing called a heaven. And he made a separation. And he separated the, the righteous spirit, the Holy Spirit of paradise and of God, the thing our heart cries out for, heaven. God took it and lifted it out of the, out of the creation and put it up in a place we call heaven and left us down here with a dead creation. We're in a dead creation. The mountains are dead. The stones are dead. The trees are dead. Our bodies are dead. Now, the reason that we cry out for heaven, we're not crying out for heaven. We don't realize it. But what we're crying out for is paradise. What we're crying out for is that spiritual touch that you get once in a while in your life when you feel that joy and that peace. And man, it turns on. You can go for two or three years on just one touch of that thing. And we say, that's heaven. That's where I want to go. And that's understandable because it's the only thing that motivates us. Otherwise, you've got nihilism. You've got existentialism. We're going nowhere. Just eat. Stuff yourself with cheeseburgers. Keep your stomach happy. Entertain yourself in some way with sex or, or booze or or uh, entertainment. Keep yourself going. Just keep going. Just keep, keep yourself off the rocks. That's existentialism. Just keep yourself off the rocks. Just keep going. But there's no meaning to anything. But deep in every person's heart, and, and, and we've got it inherited it from Adam and Eve, who had that, and it comes down in the bloodline through Noah, that somewhere there's a place of beauty and glory and joy and release and liberty and everything anyone could want. Brother, well, sister, that's not heaven. That's the spirit realm that at one time was on the earth. Now, the Bible very well could teach that someday we will leave the earth and go into that realm. And that's what we want. We want to get into that peace. We don't care whether we leave our bodies here. We just want to get into that peace. And so the Bible could teach that, but it doesn't. What it teaches is that heaven, heaven, this paradise is coming back down and clothe itself with the material realm. I say, where do you get that? All right. What is the throne of God? Heaven. Heaven is my throne, place of rulership. If you read in Revelation 21... It says that the new Jerusalem, it, this is what it says, the throne of God and of the Lamb are in it. That means heaven is in it. See? Heaven. The, heaven is my throne. The throne of God will no longer be separated from men by a heaven. And it's the throne and the presence of God that makes paradise. 
What we want is not heaven. We want the touch of God. That's the joy and the glory and the peace and the blessing and the freedom from worry and the vitality and every desirable thing where your heart sings is not in a place. It's in God. And that heaven is coming down. It came down the first time, but it had no wall around it. And so it was open to invasion by sin. That wall is being created in the hearts of suffering saints. The wall of the New Jerusalem is symbolic. It's symbolic of the resistance to sin being created in the hearts of suffering saints. And when God gets those saints with that wall against sin, that wall against the world, that wall against Satan, that wall against deception, that wall against rebellion, is their jasper built up within them, hard as jasper, beautiful laid on the foundation of the apostles of the Lamb, and all the other things that it says about that wall with the gates in it and the pearls and all the rest, when that thing is created in us, then God says, I will return. And he will return, not by himself, but surrounded by this wall of saints. And mankind on the earth, then, when they want to go to, quote, heaven, will not go up, but over the face of the earth to Zion to receive the blessing and glory and wonder and beauty of heaven from the saints. Because we will be in that day the throne of God, which means we will be this paradise, this place of heaven, this life, this river of life, this glory of joy and judgment and all that men desire, will, they will come to that light because it will be in you and me. And that's why they're waiting for the unveiling of the sons of God. Praise the Lord. Shall we say? Hallelujah.